I'm Miss Laura with the Wichita Falls Arts Council. And today I'm gonna to share a little bit about the work that I make as a professional artist and sculptor, um, specifically the wood carvings that I make. So here's an example of one of those wood carvings. They all start as a solid block of wood that I carve into this bean shape. And then I drill in for all of these holes are and I use a chisel and an wood piece without breaking it apart and just working from the outside and then refining it until I get something like this. I use different kinds of wood, some darker woods and lighter woods and they're from all over and I make them at a bunch of different scales. So some of them are sort of small and compact like this, some of them are a little bit larger some of them are very, very tiny. And today I'm going to specifically share with you one of the largest ones I've made. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like from start to finish. And then talk a little bit about this pattern that I'm using. And then we'll all do an exercise on making this pattern or how to draw this pattern. So here is a corner of my studio and all of these are wood carvings that are on the wall and they come in a bunch of different sizes. Most of these are about the size that I just showed you on my camera. And this is how all of them start. So this started off as a thousand pound log that someone dropped off at my studio on a forklift. And I have a chainsaw on the corner here and I use this chainsaw to hack off big pieces first, everything that I don't want at the end when I'm finished with my sculpture. So I'm trying to get to a very specific bean shape. So I'm cutting off all the big pieces that aren't part of that shape. And then after I've cut off the large pieces, I start cutting off smaller and smaller pieces until I get a smoother shape. And then I use different kinds of tools where you have an angle grinder with a wood carving attachment. And I'm smoothing out all of these corners and hard edges until I get a nice smooth shape. There I am, my protective gear. And there's the piece, it's starting to look a lot more like a bean. And, oh, there was some snow. This is after it's been completely sanded. It's very smooth at this point. And I start to draw a pattern on this wood with a regular colored pencil. You can see that in blue. So the pattern, basically, it, it tells me where I need to keep the wood and where I need to cut away. Here I am continuing to draw the pattern on the wood. I need to work really quickly during this point because the wood is green or it was freshly cut and it's not dry yet. And when wood dries, it shrinks. And the outside dries faster and shrinks faster than the inside because it's exposed to the air. And the outside protects the inside. So the inside, well, they dry at different rates and they shrink at different rates, which causes the wood to crack apart if I don't work really quickly. So this is after I've completely drawn this pattern all over the wood sculpture on the underside, on the top, and all of the, all of the sides. This is a giant drill bit. It's called a ship auger, and it pulls itself into the wood. And this is how I remove the wood in the first stage. So here's the same piece. You can still see that blue pattern drawn on with colored pencil. And all of these dots are holes from that drill bit. So I'm drilling as close to the center of this wood piece as I can, trying to remove as much wood as possible and as quickly as I can. And then I use smaller and smaller drill bits for all of the places where my large drill bit is too big. And I also have a hammer and a chisel and I'm chiseling out bits of wood at a time until the piece is hollow. At this point I've moved 
my sculpture to the inside of my studio. And I have a mallet and a chisel in my hand. And I'm hammering this chisel into the wood, removing more bits. And you can see all of this stuff around me, all these wood chips. These are all little pieces that started inside the sculpture, but have been removed and are now turning my studio into a hamster cage. Um, this is the point where most of the inside wood has been removed. It is completely covering the floor of my studio. And those are my shoes. This was a very exciting milestone. I could finally pick up the wood at this point. It was about 60 pounds. So I had cut away and carved out about 940 pounds from the initial log and it's dried a little bit so it's really easy to pick up at this point and then fast forward a few moves and a few studios later this is my current studio now same shelf in Dubuque Iowa and I've been working on this sculpture for the past six months three years in total and I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like in a few more slides but as the wood gets thinner and thinner, the piece becomes more delicate. So I can't keep hammering and chiseling. I have to do something different. I have to use a different tool. And so for this stage, I use an X-Acto knife and I cut away little shavings at a time. One more time. <clears throat> so you can see I'm not removing a lot. And it's a very, very slow process. So I'm gonna be doing this for a few more months and then I'll have a finished sculpture. What is fun though is, is after making all these shavings, I have a bunch of piles of them. And they make a really great sound. So I'm gonna share what it looks like right now. So this is a sculpture in its current stage. As you can see, it's very easy to maneuver. You can pick it up, move it around. It's on a foam pad to protect all the sharp edges. And it is currently about six pounds. And the goal right now is to take two more pounds off of it, which is very slow because I'm taking away a shading at a time. But I'm very excited to be able to work on a long-term project like this and get to the end. So I didn't invent this pattern that I use on all these wood carvings. Um, it's something that exists everywhere. It's called a Voronoi pattern. It was named after a Russian mathematician. Pretty sure Voronoi was his name. But we can find this pattern everywhere, especially in nature. So we might see it on the pattern of a giraffe. Right? We have these white lines creating a Voronoi. You see a little bit better here. We might see it on a close-up picture of a dragonfly right on the wings. These black lines dividing up the transparent wing material. Or in honeycombs. And it looks a little bit different because of how organized the bees are in making their honeycombs. We can see it in the fungal world. Um, this is a stinkhorn mushroom, and it creates a Voronoi cage around itself. And we can easily see all the lines that make up the pattern. But if we look really closely, we can see it on the mushroom cap as well, but just small. These are poppy seeds. So if you've ever had a poppy seed or everything bagel, those tiny itty bitty black seeds are not little black round beads. They have the same pattern, but we can't really see it 
with our human eyes. So we'll need a plain sheet of paper. Mine is green because I have a lot of green paper. White paper will work well. I have a regular pencil with an eraser. And I also have a dark colored marker. I'm using a Sharpie, but any dark colored marker will work. Okay. I'm gonna start by folding my paper in half. And I'm doing this to give myself two drawing surfaces and a smaller working space. First thing I'm gonna do is pick up my pencil. I'm going to draw a circle somewhere near the center of my paper and I'm gonna make sure it's at least bigger than a quarter. Okay. Once I have my first circle somewhere on my paper, I'm going to draw another circle next to it. And I'm gonna make sure that this second circle doesn't touch my first circle, it's close. I'm gonna make sure I could fit my finger in between my first and my second circle. I'm giving it just enough room that I can fit my finger between them. And your second circle can be smaller or larger than your first circle. Now I'm gonna continue drawing circles that are all pretty close together, but I can still fit my finger between all of them, giving them that amount of space between. And I'll do some large circles and I'll have some that go off the edges of my paper. It's gonna look like our paper is full of polka dots. Once my paper is full of circles, I have some in the middle. They're all relatively close to each other and some are going off beyond the borders of my paper. I'm going to continue using my pencil and I'm going to connect all of the circles that are closest to each other or that are next to each other with lines. And I'm gonna connect them at the point at which they are closest. So if I look at these two circles here, they're next to each other. So I'm gonna draw a line to connect them and I'm not gonna connect them over here because they are closer right here. So I'm connecting at the shortest distance that I can between circles that are next to each other. And I'm gonna go around my page and try to connect all of the circles that are next to each other with plain straight lines. I'm gonna try to get most of them. It's okay if I miss a few. Once all of my circles are connected, I'm going to find my marker. Open my marker. And start by identifying any straight line. So I'll just start with this one. 
And right at the point where a straight line touches a circle, I'm gonna put a dot. This line also touches a circle right here, dot. So at any point that a straight line touches a circle, right at that point, I'm going to put a dot right there, dot, dot. And I'm going to identify every single point that a straight line touches a circle until my page is full of dots. Once you're finished, oh, missed a couple. So once you're finished putting dots, I guess I connect right there too. All over your paper, everywhere that a straight line touches a circle, you're going to scan your paper from left to right and make sure you did not miss any. You wanna make sure you get all of them. And I'm looking, oh, there we go, okay. So this is our next and final step. Um, we are going to connect our dots now using two rules. So rule number one is I'm only gonna connect dots if a line exists between them. So if they're already connected by pencil, then I know I'm gonna connect those dots. Rule number two is that with my marker, I'm only going to draw straight lines. So only straight lines with my marker and only if there's already a line there. So if I look at these two dots, there's a line going and connecting them. So I'm going to take my marker and draw a line, a straight line to connect those dots. Um, and if I look at these two dots here, there's a line connecting them. Um, it's part of a circle, it's curved. So I know I'm gonna draw a line, but I need to make sure I draw a straight line, even if the line before was curved because it's, because it's part of a circle. So I'm gonna take my marker and draw a straight line to connect these two dots. So I'm gonna have a little bit of a curved pencil line peeking through and that's fine, I can erase that later. And I'm gonna work my way throughout my entire paper connecting dots only if there's a line between them and then only with straight lines until I trace over every existing line, every dot is connected.
After our marker has dried for a few minutes, a few seconds, I'm going to take my eraser and erase all of these lines that are peeking out underneath, clean it up a little bit. So now, after this practice side, you have the option of doing the same thing on the other side. I'm going to show you one more thing, which you can also choose to do for the second side of your paper. So most of my sculptures, they have the same pattern, but I don't use straight lines to connect my what would be dots. I have a curved line. And I do that by changing one of the last rules or the last rule at the end where I'm connecting my dots with straight lines. Let me get my paper ready. By doing all the same steps where I draw my circles. Thank you, Mr. Bird. I draw my circles and I also connect them, all the circles that are next to each other. And then I do the dots at any point a straight line touches a circle. But I change the last rule. So I still need to connect my dots, but if I were to draw a pattern on one of my sculptures with these curved lines, instead of drawing a straight line to connect dots that are already connected, I draw an S where I start the S and then end the S of the second dot. I'm drawing an S starting at one dot and then finishing the S of the second dot. So you can choose to do this, reconnect all of your dots with an S. You can do what we did before on the practice side. We could even draw a shape and then fill the pattern or fill in the shape with this pattern. Some of my S's have a very subtle curve. Other ones can be a little more aggressively curvy.
Oh, this one. This two. Thank you for joining me today. See you next time.